Tai sveiki visi prisijungę. Ar vėliau žiūrintis mūsų įrašą, tikiuosi, kad girdėt ir matot. Aš labai džiaugiuosi galėdama jūs visiems pristatyti Dmitro Solovjovą, fotografą, Ukrainos moderniosios architektūros tyrė ir pavaldosaugos entuziastą, aktyvistą iš Ukrainos. Ir šiandien per artimiausią valandą mums visiems Dmitro papasakos apie gyvenamuosius sovietmečių projektuotus Ukrainos rajonus kaip apie paveldą. Turbūt jau tą perskaitėt mūsų renginio aprašymę, na, o jei ne, tai tuo viską išgirsite nuo A iki Z. Ir prieš pristatydama paskaitą ir pašnekovą ir persijaudama į anglų kalbą, nes, na, paskaita vyks anglų kalba, noriu priminti, kad tai yra pirmoji iš trijų parodą, Vilniaus muzijaus parodą, kas į viršūs lydinčių paskaitų. Antroji vyks kitą savaitą, taip pat ketvirtadienį ir taip pat nuotolių, birželio devintą dieną, architektas iš Ukrainos Valodimyras Veštakės papasakos taip pat apie gyvenamuosius rajonus, bet šiek tiek iš kitos pusės. Tokių iššūkių kelia šiandien tai, kad ne mes, kad žmonės gyvena tuose rajonuose, projektuotuose sovietmečių ir kaip reikėtų tos iššūkius spręsti. Na, trečioji paskaita, tai Lietuvos architektų sąjungos pirmininkas Rūtos Leitanaitės paskaita jau vyks gyvai apie valistinę gyvenamųjų rajonų daugiebučių renovaciją. Tai vyks birželio 16 dieną. Bet parada lydi ne vien paskaitos, o ir ekskursijos. Artimiausia ekskursija po viršuliškės vyks šį šeštadienį kartu su parolos kuratoriumi Povilu Andriumi Stepavičiumi. Ir ekskursijos pradžia yra 11 valandą. Tų jų gatvėdų registruotis nereikia, renginys nemokamas, tai raginu nepasididžiuoti ir nepatingėti ir atvykti. O taip pat dar paskutinis dalykas, kurį lietuviškai pasakysiu, tai kad kviečiu visus žiūrinčiuosius po šiuo vaizdo įrašų, po transliaciją komentaruose uždavinėti klausimus, jei tik jų kyla, galite tai daryti ir angliškai, ir lietuviškai. And I will switch to English now. To all our English-speaking viewers, I know that there are some. Uh, welcome. Uh, today we will hear a presentation by Ukrainian photographer, writer, architecture researcher, uh, heritage preservation activist and tour guide Dmitro Solovyov about uh, living districts that have been uh, built in Ukraine during uh, the Soviet times. And uh, I believe some of you uh, may know Dmitro for his project Ukrainian Modernism. Uh, I checked uh, the accounts of this project in various social media channels have almost 100k followers. So in Lithuania, such numbers would be considered uh, quite high. And uh, we haven't invited uh, Dmitro to talk to us about architecture of living districts uh, built during the Soviet times accidentally. Uh, we currently are holding an exhibition about such a district uh, only in Vilnius, not in Ukraine. So uh, we all are really interested uh, what Dmitro has to say to us. And uh, a huge shout out to Oksana Duma, uh, a uh, culture uh, manager, who has suggested we invite Dmitro to speak. So thank you, Oksana. I believe you are watching. Hello. <laughs> and uh, today, earlier, uh, we spoke uh, uh, I spoke with Dimitra and he suggested that if any questions arise during his presentation, uh, we shouldn't hesitate and wait until the end of presentation or lecture and ask him immediately. So I will try to uh, be the voice of, of audience questions and uh, all questions can be asked uh, directly at comments, uh, comment section of our broadcast. Uh, if you have any questions, maybe uh, which pop to your head at the end of, 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 of this presentation, uh, write them anyway. We might have short Q&A session afterwards. So, hello, Dimitro. Uh, you may turn on your, your camera and share screen and the floor is yours. Hello, Ruta. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Um, this is actually my first online lecture, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, 
around fourth lecture in general, uh, but first uh, online one. So I'm a bit nervous. Uh, I hope you'll excuse me for that. Um, yeah, the first public online lecture. I'm more used to doing live tours, but I was super happy when uh, Vilnius Museum uh, invited me to do this talk and I agreed right away. Uh, because first of all, I love Lithuania. I've been there many times uh, in Vilnius, obviously. And um, I like uh, Soviet residential areas. Actually, they are kind of my speciality. I uh, spend a lot of time there uh, just chilling or taking pictures or doing tours. Mm. Uh, a, a big part of my project dedica is dedicated to, to micro districts, micro rayone. I find them weirdly charming and trying to, to, to communicate their value, which is not obvious to many, to the people. Uh, yeah, but first of all, uh, yeah, I already thanked uh, the museum, everyone who invited me, Oksana, uh, Ruta Zivile, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, as uh, Ruta already um, introduced me, I won't repeat uh, who, who am I. Uh, I think let's just go straight to the to the to the presentation. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay. Uh, here it goes. Uh, Ruta, if something is not working, let me know. I think it should be working now. I hope you all can see. Uh, yeah, it's good. Okay. Mm. Mm. So yeah, Soviet residential areas. And uh, what about them? Why are they uh, important? And why, why they need to be preserved? And uh, I saw that the the title, the name of this uh, exhibition in series of talks has something to do with virtual ishkes, and I decided to put this picture uh, on the cover of this presentation uh, because I'm um, no stranger to virtual ishkes. I've uh, been there a couple of times, even stayed there. My uh, very good friend uh, lives there. Uh, Egle, if you're watching, hello. Um, yeah, so I uh, have uh, very fond memories of this place, and that's also one of the reasons why I uh, so eagerly accepted this invitation to do this, to join this um, um, exhibition. And yeah, the famous uh, rooster sculpture. Uh, I've been there and took this picture and almost uh, all of the contemporary pictures here uh, are mine. And uh, uh, okay, next slide. Yeah, yeah, it's working. So yeah, probably needless already uh, because you already know who am I and what I'm doing. Um, basically taking pictures of uh, Panelki and uh, getting pictured in front of Panelki with a Panelki sweater, um, as you can see here. Um, yeah, and this is my project. Uh, my main tool, um, which evolved from a, like a documentation account where just uh, where, when, when I saw the rate of destruction which uh, modernism in, in Ukraine faces, I decided to preserve uh, it, this heritage of the second part of the 20th century, at least on camera and film. Um, but later as my audience grew, um, I thought that I can um, share why it is important to preserve it and uh, share the beauty and the functionality and 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 uh, what's what's so special and and why why should we cherish it instead of uh, demolishing and neglecting it? And so that was uh, that, that's the short story of my um, project, which I spent a lot of time uh, running and 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 uh, 
creating content for it. Um, yeah. And uh, before before we start, <laughs> before we start the 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 talk on the Soviet residential districts, which is a very controversial topic, especially in Ukraine. Mm, they're controversial all over the world, but in Ukraine, they have a, another stigma of Soviet Union attached to it. So it's a little bit more controversial. But first of all, let me share my experience of spending time and living in Virtualistis. Uh, maybe people from Vilnius um, might be interested in a uh, foreigner's perspective on, on this um, neighborhood, which is a centerpiece of uh, this exhibition. Um, I found it fascinating and super comfortable. Mm, so green, like whole Lithuania and Vilnius is green, obviously. And uh, it's like, a, like a city in a forest was uh, uh, amazing for me, a person from, from the steppes, in, born in the steppes of South uh, Ukraine, to walk around these uh, forested built areas. And I had a lot of fun and I also loved the, the buildings. I loved their design, their facades and how well, kind of well kept they are. They are in a, in a better shape uh, then, then in, in Ukraine, and as far as I know, um, the Chernobyl TV series HBO was uh, shot somewhere around here. Um, yeah, so this is a few pictures I took back in uh, 2018. Yeah, mm, this is the building of the radar, if I'm not mistaken. In in the background, uh, this is a, a few uh, panelki. Uh, during the beautiful sunrise, um, a building that has something to do with firearms, don't remember correctly. And yeah, another one, don't remember. And that's the, the Virchulishkes from above. This picture I took in 2016, I guess. Uh, probably my first or second visit to Vilnius uh, from, the, from that awesome TV tower. Mm, and here uh, we can see already what's uh, what's good <laughs> about um, Soviet uh, modernist Soviet residential areas, because uh, areas like this were not exclusive to Soviet Union. They were built um, just as any modern architecture all over the world, because uh, modernism was the first truly global architecture style. Uh, of course, modern architecture and uh, city planning had the, their own peculiarities in Soviet Union, but the general approach was uh, just the same as in France or, uh, let's say, uh, Australia. Um, so here we can see um, thoughtfully uh, Mm, forgot the word. Mm, I it. <laughs> How they thoughtfully they are put uh, onto the uh, area, so there is enough space between buildings, and uh, they stand uh, in harmony to each other. And so uh, while you walk around, uh, the view is mm, never the same. Although it can get uh, a bit repetitive. But uh, to me, it's not a bug, it's a feature. Uh, repetitiveness as a, a minimalistic architecture can be a plus uh, to me. And what I love, again, about Vilnius is how forested and how green um, the city is. Look, like from above, these buildings are just uh, lost in, in the ocean of green. Like one could think it's uh, some abandoned town, but no, it's uh, people live there. <laughs> and yeah, I, I, I used to call uh, like my friend and, and all who live there like forest elves. I hope it's not insulting. Uh, yeah, because it, it's a compliment. Yeah, and now uh, it's 
quick uh, over over um, overlook on on virtual issues and my experience in Vilnius and virtual issues with uh, your Soviet residential areas. And now let's go straight to the um, to the con controversy of of Soviet uh, residential areas and the stigma uh, they have uh, today in, in Ukraine um for sure don't know about other countries um and even uh oksana who first invited me to to do this talk uh he said if i may quote he said something about um, that the exhibition will be about some proletarian uh district in vilnius and it was with some negative connotations and said it would be good if you can talk about some similarly ugly districts from Kiev. <laughs> I was almost offended because uh, I said I, I don't find that they are like uh, bad or, or whatever and they say yeah sure I, I would love to and uh, th this gave me uh, the scale of this stigma uh, that uh, very few people are able to see through the stigma of the Soviet Union and everything that's connected with it, all the negative stuff that was there. Um, see through the state in which those residential buildings are now, uh, they were not supposed to look like that. Yeah, they were not built of the best quality materials, but still. Uh, yeah, and, and this stigma has many, many uh, sides. Like, for example, uh, what can one, uh, I don't know, uh, average person think uh, when uh, asked about some Soviet neighborhood? He would say it's uh, dangerous, dirty uh all of the same all the buildings are the same it's boring to be there and and this is probably the picture that uh, people might paint if they not live there or, or if they do uh maybe foreigners about your typical soviet neighborhood and actually yeah you can find uh, some of those places uh as you can see in the picture because this picture is real i it's not a photoshop but mostly i think russia is uh, well known for those kind of uh, um, areas especially with russia's climate uh, but in vilnius it's a bit different uh, much different um, so in reality what soviet district looks like it looks like this uh, at least in vilnius in ukraine it's something in between uh there is a lot of space between buildings uh you can walk you can play you can uh, chill even do barbecue whatever and it's not possible with the contemporary development in kiev of course if if done properly with all the new uh urbanism knowledge it can be better it can be much better uh there is no limit to perfection and soviet districts by no means were perfect no but comparing to what we have now i will uh, go to that uh in a few moments about what we have now this is uh uh yeah i see a hand i will finish my uh sentence in a moment and uh, pl please uh go ahead with the question uh greenery all the space is filled with uh, trees and grass and it's much more pleasant to spend time there um, instead of a pool of concrete and so when i'm doing my tours i try to bring people's attention about it uh, so the 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 value of those um, neighborhoods it's not in architecture because uh, yeah mostly it was type architecture um, there were a limited number of designs uh, hundreds of them but a limited number many of them were um, mm, repeated but it's the space and space i think it's it's the best and most characteristic 
feature of modernist architecture. Without space, those buildings, those districts, they, they just cease to exist, cease to work as they intended. And if you put a lot of kiosks, a lot of garages, a lot of uh, new buildings inside of those areas, they're just a, a terrible place to be. And uh, now I think, yeah, please, uh, if, if there is a question, I see a raised hand. Yes, uh, speaking about stigma, I wanted to ask uh, if there is this uh, concern in Ukraine regarding the state of these modernist buildings, uh, state of these buildings that have been built during the Soviet times, because I believe in Vilnius, this particular concern is of, of, of importance. Uh, we had an occasion a year or, or, or two ago where uh, a part of this huge monolith building just uh, fell because of poor quality. So I wanted to ask whether uh, it is so in Ukraine. <laughs> I uh, think for the question, I have not heard about uh, moments when buildings just fell down. Uh, they, they are falling now, but that's just because of uh, Russian rockets falling from the sky. Mm. Yes, the quality is not perfect of the of the materials. Often uh, one can see um, the forget the word mm. the bricks. Yeah, um, showing through the through the stucco, mm. but. I have never experienced that it led to some consequences. Um, they not they are not perfect to live inside, especially the buildings from the fifties and from the sixties when there was a, a horrible financial state after the after the war and after especially after the Stalin era, and uh, when people were just living in barracks and uh, the state needed to house millions of people in a matter of months so those buildings are yeah of pretty poor quality but they can be refurbished and it's been done even in france they also have this architecture and one of the latest winners of some architecture exhibition i don't remember the name uh, so the go the medal was received by uh, by a um a refer a refurbishment project of a like, 60s 50s modernist uh residential building so and i myself live in a um uh, not a panelka but a brick building from the 70s mm, and uh, i have no complaints uh the soundproof uh not too bad kind of spacious for, for for one person like one one room apartment so uh yeah i i had no issues and even in my hometown of zaporizhia when we lived in in a in a building from the 50s super small uh yeah wasn't a super um, privileged or um, fashionable places to be but i had no like severe breakdowns because of uh, quality or something so i would say uh, they're fine and uh, if i'm answered your question i will go on uh, listing uh yes, pros. Thank you. yeah um of the of the soviet residential areas I've talked about space. Uh, I've talked about the greenery. They're all filled with trees and 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 uh, yeah, other greenery, which obviously makes oxygen. And then it's social infrastructure. Uh, everything was planned, and uh, at, at, in every district, in every micro district, they were building schools and kindergartens and. Uh, Occasionally, a cinema, a library, um, some grocery stores. Um, and this is what, I what is lacking 
in the contemporary development in Kiev today. They just built houses, houses, houses close to each other, just right next to each other and nothing. So um, I don't know how many, if there were any schools built in, in Kiev since 1991, maybe a couple. Uh, while the population of Kiev doubled since uh, 1991. So we still use Soviet social infrastructure. And um, even if you see, if you look at the any any district uh, on Google Google Maps and turn on aerial view, you can clearly see like the plan uh, school, school, kindergarten, kindergarten, uh, inside the yards often, and it makes for a safe space. Kids do not have to cross uh, roads, which are often, uh, which were often uh, in in Ukraine. Road is a very dangerous place. <laughs> um, so yeah, the 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 district was self sufficient. You could find, uh, and you still can find like almost everything that you need, um, food, often some sport facilities, um, education, and occasionally entertainment, like a small cinema, uh, because while today in Ukraine, we're having uh, this small thing uh, where uh, cinemas are built in into the, into the malls, uh, shopping centers, while uh, during the Soviet era in Kiev, uh, in every in every district there was a, a separate cinema. Uh, so basically, theoretically, I didn't live there. Uh, a person could spend like all their time in in his neighborhood. Um, yeah. Uh, then they were relatively well planned. Uh, architects didn't have much to do in the 50s in the 60s because like the residential architecture was typed uh, and designed around them templates and so they spent their time um, uh, creating the best infrastructure uh, calculating the number of steps one should uh, should should take to reach a school or a kindergarten or a grocery store. Um, and uh, yeah, in, as opposed to uh, today, when uh, no thought at all is involved into planning, no general plan. And uh, yeah, uh, they were, more or less well thought out and uh, if you if you if you pay attention uh, you can you can see it for yourself and what else in reality yeah the they're actually uh, getting quite popular and even uh, some music music artists come to give to shot their music videos in modernist buildings and even in your basic uh soviet neighborhoods like no uh scandinavian pop singer with her song kamikaze i think yeah and uh, these soviet districts especially shine when compared to contemporary residential areas that we are getting for the last uh 20 years in kiev so comparing to this, I would, yeah, that's why I use the word charming. I would, I would say that this is charming because this is a real uh, screenshot from Google Street View in Kiev on the left bank. Uh, I don't know what hell looks like, but my personal hell is this. And people pay uh, insane amounts of money to get a, an apartment there, um, totally absurd. So yeah, and this is what uh, our contemporary de development in Kiev looks like. Uh, developers, the industry is not regulated in the least, and all the developers are 
caring about is uh, profits and uh, the amount of square meters is all that matters so they uh, turn out building after building next to each other super tall super long and there is no stopping of them yeah and actually uh, our mayor vitalik lichko has a lot of friends amongst the developers and then a lot of of the developers in ukraine um actually deputies and members of the government uh, Rada, and they are effectively lobbying their interest so uh, it's a kind of vicious circle and uh, <laughs> kind of a plague that has befallen us um this is a an advertising picture from the website of a developer uh, in Kiev. Uh, and, and, and it's so perfect. Here you can actually see uh, the difference between uh, Soviet residential um, architecture and Ukrainian contemporary architecture. Uh, see for yourself if you notice uh, differences in scale here. Mm. So what's wrong? I will I will run briefly about what's wrong with contemporary residential areas in Kyiv. Uh, pay attention to what's uh, um, in front and and to the background as well. <laughs> uh, just a, a notion of concrete almost always ugly um they're not paying much to the architects to design this obviously so it's uh for me uh, a pain to look at uh madness of colors uh chaotically chaotically placed no general plan um enormous inhuman scale um, architecture should scale uh should be perceived uh, by by us uh, properly, and uh, like the the ideal number of floors is five. Sixteen is uh, like max, but if if placed far from the from the road, so if there is a lot of space between an object and, and the road it, it's not that bad but contemporary the, these monsters they're building them like adjacent to the road like there is a couple of meters of sidewalk and it just it just um forget the word whatever looms over you yeah looms as i've said before there is no social infrastructure uh there are huge queues to get into a kindergarten and school in kiev and often there is even no parking so it creates uh, local transportation collapses uh they're often gated these communities uh yeah so just a a disaster yeah so but let's go back to the our um main topic the soviet uh residential areas and uh, when i realized uh, how valuable they are especially in in the wake of what we are getting today uh, from our generous developers um, i decided to talk about them via my uh, page and uh, also i i found found them this Soviet districts kind of um, appealing. And uh, maybe that's because I just love uh, modernist urban planning and uh, abundance of space because uh, all, all parts of the city, they're um, very tightly built. So I don't feel uh, I love space instead of uh, being in, instead of secluded areas. So often I find myself uh, going to 
left bank of Kiev. It's uh, mostly uh, a newer part of town developed in the uh, second part of uh, 20th century. And I just go to the, to the rivers or to the lakes and spend my time there. I feel, I feel much, I don't know, comfortable there. Uh, so I decided to share my feelings with my um, followers. So I started making little posts about history, about uh, yeah, just sharing the aesthetics and decided to work on destigmatizing them uh, as part of my general mission on destigmatizing the um, modern architecture in Ukraine in general. And those posts about Panelki, about the micro rayoni, uh, they were most popular, but also most controversial. They were getting the most likes, but also a lot of hateful comments, like uh, people, my followers uh, commenting that, oh my God, it's so hideous. How could you even find something beautiful in there? So yeah, funny. And uh, then I started um, posting pictures of how they looked. Uh, before, so people can realize that what is how they look now, it's not the way it was intended. And uh, <laughs> maybe a lot of the negativity comes from its contemporary state. Like, uh, this is the same building in the 80s and, uh, well, basically today. Also, notice no tram. Yeah, unfortunately, no tram. Uh, yeah, then just uh, general aesthetics. It's Sonich uh, Neozero, uh, sunny lake in in Kiev, and uh, amazing beach. People hang out there, spending their uh, weekends, and me as well. So I don't know. I feel at home there. Um, yeah, a bit of more of a frontal. Uh, aesthetics mm, or uh, romantic, if you if you will. There were also uh, gigantic projects in in the Soviet times, uh, but somehow they they at least look uh, as a as something that a lot of thought was put into. And this repetitive repetitiveness uh, can come off as beautiful, at least in my eyes. Uh, although, of course, I prefer um, five-story buildings, which are, can be found, a lot of, of them can be found in Vilnius, because Vilnius is a kind of smaller city than Kyiv. But in Kyiv, yeah, they have to house a lot of people. So they uh, build a lot of um, floors. Uh, and then after doing a series of those posts about uh, so, uh, Soviet micro districts of Kiev, I decided, um, why don't I uh, do tours around them? Um, I did my first public tour actually in a Soviet district a few years ago. I chose it because um, there were a lot of beautiful monumental sculptures which actually started, ignited my passion for monumental art. And I decided to show uh, people beauty of them. And uh, two years later, uh, last autumn, I decided to continue and focus on um, Soviet residential areas. And uh, from autumn, last autumn, until the war started, I uh, did, I don't remember, around, around four or five districts around Kyiv, had plans for many more. I think for, for every Soviet district, I had plans of doing a, a tour around there. And actually, they were very successful and popular. Uh, on my first tour, it was around Trayeshina, famous, famous, uh, negatively famous even neighborhood in, in, in Kiev. Around 40 people came. I had to um, close the 
the invitation form because there were just too many requests and and i i repeated this tour the next day uh the next week just because of the demand uh we during the tours we we're hunting uh monumental art objects like you see this bar relief uh in the background um also witness uh the unfortunate fate of some of the monumental artworks which are getting destroyed by vandals or by uh, city officials uh people of all ages come to my tours kids as you can see in france and elderly people uh sometimes they even even strangers join our tour <laughs> and and stay until the very end and it's always funny to to see the reaction from the locals from the locals who are not participating in the tour uh and, and especially the kids who are playing and just seeing um a huge number of people walking by in line and they're pointing fingers and saying like hey what's going on there uh yeah so i uh it's always an adventure uh so yeah this is was my most popular tour around Thracian, which houses over 300,000 residents if i'm not mistaken it's around uh, half of vilnius um so <laughs> many people were shocked like why would you do a tour there like i would never go there purposefully to that place but after the tour they uh, they found uh, things of value there and and that's that's what's make me happy that's people locals or not uh seeing the city the environment with new eyes and appreciate starting appreciating things they 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 they, they weren't uh, so i think uh yeah it's 45 minutes i was told to to prepare a talk of 45 minutes that's the end of it i hope you i hope i wasn't too rushful and i hope you understood something from from what i've said so so briefly it's a huge topic i hope i cover at least some part of it and uh, made uh, something clear for you and um, if you have any questions please ask uh, here is a funny <laughs> icon of panelka thank you for your interest and uh, yeah if you if you if you like the pictures or the topic uh, please scan this if you're on on um, on desktop please scan this qr code if you're on mobile uh, memorize this um accounts ukraine and modernism on my personal Dmitry Solyov, and uh, i would i would be happy if you'll uh, join me online and uh, this is it for the presentation uh ruta yeah so thank you Dmitry. it was really a very interesting and uh... I have some questions uh, of my own. There are some questions from our viewers, so maybe I will start with the latter, with the questions from our viewers. Uh, the first one is uh, regarding the first slide of your presentation in which uh, you, you have shown uh, the, the sculpture of the rooster. And uh, uh, are there any works of art uh, related or integrated in such architecture in Kiev, uh, would they have had an impact on stigma? I believe you have partially answered that question uh, by showing a mural on the wall, but maybe you could elaborate on whether there are many such examples of, of uh, art being incorporated in the architecture of, uh, of, uh, of these districts. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's part of the charm of the districts that um, architects and city planners actually realized that sometimes those districts uh, were repetitive in a negative sense and they wanted to breathe life into them and make them simply more interesting. And 
almost always they have uh, commissioned artworks, public artworks. Mm, so now I would I would say that every micro district is a museum under sky because so many statues and mosaics um, done by professional artists, Ukrainian, Lithuanian, and uh, yes, I specifically focus on monumental art during my tours to highlight those objects, uh, which are truly unique. If uh, residential buildings aren't uh, unique, there are some individual projects, but they were rare, at least in Kiev, they were rare. Um, mostly it was type, type architecture, while artworks, monumental artworks are unique. Almost always they were unique, uh, done by often famous uh, Ukrainian artists. And I try to uh, yeah, focus people's attention on that. But unfortunately, <laughs> this happens sometimes. Um, this is the remains of a similar sculpture. OK, it's not similar, completely different, but a sculpture, uh, a mosaic sculpture in one of the kibbs areas it uh, two of the sculptures were um, created by a um, ukrainian artists when the school was built uh, here the school is in in the background and for the kids uh, they commissioned this artist to to create two sculptures and uh, last year the school director decided to take them down and not just like carefully remove, but to demolish. So uh, a tractor came and just tore them down. And uh, we were even even locals, they were like shocked, like, hey, I remember it from my childhood. And, and then we, uh, me and my colleagues uh, who work on monumental art, we rushed to the uh, to the school and uh, had a chance to talk with the director. And she said, like, what? Why are you like yelling? It's just some Soviet old stuff. Um, I think it's 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 good that it is gone. So it's very tricky <laughs> to work with this um, heritage because yeah, sometimes, oftentimes, people are struggling to disconnect from political, ideological things, and from from art, from from the notion that it's not. Soviet, it's it's Ukrainian. It's done by Ukrainian artists, or in Vilnius' case, uh, Lithuanian artists. Oh, you're on mute, uh, Ruta. Okay, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, there is a follow-up uh, question uh, uh, regarding. Uh, popular view on on uh, both such monuments and uh, these districts as heritage so we know and we understand that the stigma has existed for quite some time uh, even I, not even i mean it was obvious that uh, it existed uh, between the start of the war and i want to address the elephant in the room uh, what do you think how will uh, the war affect uh, people's uh, view on uh, on this on such architecture and such monuments whether there will be after of course ukraine wins the war whether there will be an impulse uh, to uh, I don't know, tear everything down and refurbish uh, uh, towns, cities uh, of Ukraine with, with new architecture in order to remove everything that is Soviet, or uh, people will start looking differently at 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 such uh, buildings uh, because of of the destruction and and so on. <laughs> Yeah, uh, this question deserves a separate lecture. Um, and it's been my pain for the last months. Um, I fear that this will come to be, and indeed it, it happened, that people started to 
associate um, Ukrainian Soviet heritage with Russia. It doesn't make sense to me, but it does uh, for, for many people in Ukraine who try to um, distance themselves as much as, as possible and, and uh, kind of retaliate in any way they can. So they, 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 they find what they can retaliate against. And sometimes they find Soviet monuments. Um, and uh, there's been a growing trend over the last couple of months uh when uh, second world war uh, memorials were demolished especially in uh, western regions in ukraine um which were until uh, 1945 part of poland and uh yeah and on the same hand uh paradoxically uh some soviet uh objects are becoming symbols of resistance for example the motherland statue in kiev i think you all know it it's uh, one of the most prominent symbols of kiev of the kiev's 20, 20th century um many people who are even like openly anti-soviet uh, heritage post pictures with it with some uh, like positive messages that we will win. Uh, some people even even uh, refer to this motherland monument as like our protector. Uh, it actually it's actually placed uh, against uh, Russia in the direction of Russia with this shield uh, and sword up. So a direct confrontation with a. <laughs> Uh, motherland statue in Volgograd in Russia, which faces our direction and calls people to arms, while our prote protects with shield and sword. Uh, yeah, so it's a uh, it's a paradox and uh, it's just a very hectic and and difficult times. Uh, people are not always guided by reason in this extremely painful uh, times. Mm, uh, I would argue about distancing Ukrainian Soviet heritage from, from Russia, uh, because as I've said, um, all those buildings, all those artworks, buildings were designed by Ukrainian architects, artworks were uh, created by Ukrainian artists who poured their soul, their, their craft, their skill, their time, their efforts, their lives into it, creating it. Um, and this is just what we have from, from, the, from the 20th century. We don't have any other heritage. And uh, yeah, I've actually <laughs> uh, compiled an article of uh, why um, Soviet Ukraine is not Russian and actually it would be unfair to to give to Russia our Soviet Ukrainian heritage because at the same time Russia very much wants to claim it to claim the rights to the whole Soviet heritage of the Soviet Union even to claim the rights of on the victory in the Second World War uh, saying it's exclu exclusively done by uh, Russian Russians, Russian soldiers, a statement made by Putin himself. Uh, while 7 million uh, Ukrainians died during the Second World War. And um, many of those people who are listed on those war memorials that's, that are being destroyed in Western Ukraine are Ukrainians. So it's a very controversial uh, topic and uh, in, in 2014, when uh, Russia annexed Crimea and started the war in, in Donetsk and Luhansk, um, there was an aftermath uh, the decommunization law that resulted, it was horribly communicated. It was against Soviet symbols. 
but it was communicated uh, as uh, against Soviet heritage and many mosaics, innocent mosaics, sometimes even not having not any, any symbols were torn down, destroyed. Uh, even in the law, in the documentation law, it specifically stated that this law does not apply to works of art. Uh, that was in 2014. So uh, I'm very apprehensive about what will follow uh, this war. I think we should focus on defeating Russia and not defeating our heritage. Thank you. Uh, actually, we had one question about what you have just said about this, uh, the communization and the Sovietization, uh, how, how it works in Ukraine. And uh, I have two more questions. One is from me, the other one is from our viewers. So I will start with the one from the viewers. Uh, there is a popular demand uh, for you to tell more about the uh, Troishchina district. So I believe you are a specialist at this uh, district. So yes, please, please enlighten us. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's fabulous. And it's um, a target of so many memes and anecdotes in, in, in Ukraine. Uh, there is a famous joke about it mm. how will Treshina be in, in English um, I, I, yeah a crack um, when there's a, when a crack appears in your life uh, you move to Treshina so uh, in Ukraine it's like uh, which illustrates how <laughs> you move to Treshina which illustrates <laughs> uh, what feelings the general public has uh, towards it. Uh, but actually when I, after uh, joining my tours, people usually change their mind about it. They, they, they notice that it's um, kind of even unique um, neighborhood because um, there, is, there was an experiment in, in color uh, almost all the facades, all, all the buildings were usually either white or brown or gray uh, in the Soviet Union or it's general modernist trend. But in, uh, it was often criticized even during the Soviet times that this uh, repetitive and uh, for someone bland color scheme. So in Troyeshna, they decided to do an experiment and uh, commissioned artists to to create a color scheme for the whole uh, the whole district mm, there are around uh, 15 or 20 districts in Troyeshina and the first micro district mm, got this uh, special color scheme this experiment when famous Ukrainian artists uh, monumental artists who who created a lot of mosaics and tapestries uh, developed uh, kind of murals that uh, ways of color that go from um, it's, it's better to to sh to show than than to describe so I will find uh, the post my post about it waves of color that uh, go from one uh, building to another, creating a, a holistic picture. Uh, let me, a moment, let me show you how it looks in real life, not in pictures. And uh, uh, I would like to just uh, clarify, when was this district built? I would uh, early early eighties early eighties and uh, but the development uh, was carried out up until the second half of the nineties so for fifteen years uh, it's uh, again houses more than three hundred thousand of people uh, yeah so uh, for fifteen years uh, this area was developed. 
And until then, there was just a few villages, and hence, hence the name, Triashina. It's actually um, the name of the village that was there, and uh, which gave name to the, to the, to the district. So uh, 1981 was the the year when when it was when development started. Uh, famous, like famous. Uh, well-known Kiev architects uh, were asked to to develop to design the general plan, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, and they they invited uh, the artists. And uh, let me share my screen and show you. Um, how it looks. Unfortunately, there is a um gloomy weather oh no i'd rather wait, wait, wait. Yeah, okay um let me share my screen share screen yeah this so here you can see uh the waves of white and red and brown colors uh switching from one buildings to another creating a, a picture together here and when you enter the the district from from that road every time it surprises me like the scale and uh yeah this um the idea of creating a consistent uh color color paint for every building in micro district uh, which moves with you and uh, with every step it changes slightly and uh, yeah and then um, uh, yeah so you can ask uh, some next next questions and I will find uh, more pictures of that beautiful uh, experiment okay so uh, I have a question I did uh, a little bit of research before <laughs> research uh, before uh, your uh, presentation and uh, well my ukrainian is not that good but i've seen in your uh, facebook i believe accounts or maybe on, on on instagram your i mean ukrainian modernism that there has been a march uh, of ten thousand people uh, participated there as i understood it was sort of uh, uh, not action, not a protest, but uh, movements uh, of uh, heritage preservation. And as I understood, it was particularly about what you've told us about this uh, modernist uh, architecture preservation. I'm not sure if I understood correctly, so I would uh, ask to clarify. And uh, as I understood, uh, uh, you have a lot of uh, colleagues or followers because uh, 10,000 people participating in an event uh, dedicated solely to uh, architecture and heritage. I mean, that's something <laughs> really. Thank you, but unfortunately, it wasn't dedicated exclusively to the to heritage. It would be it would have been great, yes, having 10,000 people coming to protect some building. Uh, we're gathering hundreds of people uh, or even thousands in case of Kvita Ukraini, um, probably most popular protest against the demolition of a unique modernist building in Kiev. But that march, uh, it was a bit different. Um, it was uh, not only about heritage, it was about <laughs> everything because um, almost every municipal um, area in, in municipal area in terms of um, quality of life like um, ecology transportation um, development um, cycling uh, issues um, everything is in a pretty depressive state so around 40 uh, initiatives, local initiative, grassroots initiatives of Kyiv um, gathered to organize a general march, uh, a movement, uh, a protest um, 
to bring um, the attention of of um, of the government of Kiev municipality and of Kiev citizens to all those um, pressing issues that we have in the city, like uh, horrible ecology, uh, enormous amount of cars, um, uh, destruction of heritage, uh, no bicycle infrastructure, uh, lack of social infrastructure, um, uh, chaos in terms of street ads, and uh, so on and so forth. And uh, we had different clusters uh, that were marching, like uh, we call them columns. So there was a column for ecology, a column for uh, um, bicycle users, a column for, uh, I was leading a column for the heritage preservation. <laughs> um, uh, one of the loudest, I would say. <laughs> and we were, we were uh, holding banners um with um uh, slogans like um restore not destroy mm, and uh, every every other initiative were um shouting uh, like uh, mottos of their uh their field where they, they work uh like uh, animal rights as well and uh yeah that's that's what was it all about it it, it gathered around 10 10 000 people yes and uh but unfortunately the 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 results were less enthusiastic than we expected uh unfortunately the 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 key municipality the mayor um um acknowledged that it happened but no changes in policies were made and uh, i think we have to go for another march okay and uh, questions keep on popping i thought this should be the last question but now this one will be the last one this is uh, from our viewer and it is sort of related to what you have just mentioned and what you uh spoke of during your presentation uh so do you think that uh, after the war uh i mean after the Ukraine wins obviously uh the situation regarding building uh modern contemporary houses will somehow change uh, i mean uh the pro that that the priority of 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 uh, building these houses will be people and not uh, profit for real estate uh, developers uh, it, it, it's a beautiful idea i mean yeah absolutely absolutely but i fear uh this won't come to pass um already already i see as signs that things will actually get worse instead of get better uh already city mayors are inviting notorious developers from kiev and uh, inspect destroyed uh, neighborhoods in their towns together make pictures together and make plans for uh, building new buildings uh, i think uh, there will be from what i've read from analysis that i've read and from my gut feelings uh it will be just another scheme in terms of that uh the government plans to give uh, without any competition uh funds to the developers so they built uh this um buildings in instead of destroyed ones um but uh, but yeah, without competition and and without any um, clear uh, understanding of how money uh, is counted and uh, where do the profits go and if, if it's profitable or not. Um, unfortunately, already, as we speak, uh, government is trying to pass laws 
uh, that erase regulations and uh, so it, it, if it if it get uh, if they those um, uh, last project will get passed uh, it will be much easier to <laughs> to build without without any permissions to build on uh, in in parks on forested areas so the a lot of regulations have been lifted and proposed uh, to be lift lifted mm, so i'm very actually um, <laughs> apprehensive about this because uh, our government was corrupt and apparently it's not changing even in the face of war like take zelensky he has shown himself as an amazing diplomat uh, in the wake of the war and i am proud of his diplomatic efforts but uh, just recently he said that hey maybe we should destroy all soviet buildings all those panelki i think we should not uh restore them i think we just need to raise them all and to build something new <laughs> well which uh, sounds like kind of populism because uh, in kiev like seven sixty percent of population uh, live in 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 soviet uh, buildings and we have a severe severe budget deficit so um yeah yeah but but as i've said again um basically developers run the government uh, sometimes they're legally elected there like vadim stolar uh, to name one and uh, many of them are okay yeah so it's it's a long topic and uh, <laughs> actually unfortunately i don't find uh, science to be optimistic i would love to okay thank you so much for your time and for sharing your knowledge and experience uh, with us all, um, with me, our viewers. And uh, I hope that uh, we will have the ability quite soon to uh, visit Trashchina and your, 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 join your tour <laughs> because uh, you definitely have left us all intrigued. And, uh, you're sharing screen, so uh, elaborate. <laughs> no, it, it just it just creation. Uh, those colorful buildings. So to to accompany your words about you wanting to visit it, which it pleases me greatly. Of course, uh, I mean we will visit, uh, won't we? Uh, I just spoke to our viewers <laughs> in the <laughs> in the comfort of their homes. I believe all of them had nodded, nodded or said yes. So once again, uh, thank you very much and uh, hopefully see you live soon. And uh, thank for all our viewers for, for your time and your questions. And uh, see you on other events of uh, Vilnius Museum. Thank you.